uh, thank you for inviting me to participate. It's a, a really an honor. Um, spent two years at WHO in um, Geneva as part of my work at CDC in the US and really enjoyed the opportunity to work globally. Uh, and this is a, a, a real uh, pleasure for me to be here. So uh, we'll get started and hopefully have, we'll have time for questions and, and, and enter any comments into the uh, uh, chat. Um, next slide, please. So uh, we want to just begin with some definitions of, of things you've heard around a lot about already, uh, but particularly talking about the socio-ecologic model um, and what can be done at the community level and provide some examples of what I'll provide of our work uh, with refugees uh, in uh, the Atlanta area. And that'll be followed with a, a, a a report from the University of Rochester on some of their community-based strategies. Uh, next, please. And we hope that you'll understand the concept of community uh, as part of a, a model um, that is both uh, influenced by individuals and also the community is influenced by external factors and the social ecological logical model you'll see in a second what well, was a good way of framing that um, we'll talk about community level interventions and uh, uh, what possible strategies might work uh, next so uh, and this is I think something I learned and heard this morning uh, that community interventions involve members of the community and engage them um, in creating uh, change and and a word that I see I see a lot lately uh, in different areas of not just the uh, COVID work but otherwise is is the word co uh, co co which is the beginning of community but we've heard it this morning around co management and co involvement co engagement so be thinking of of co as a critical level of uh, a critical term in terms of community level. And it, it should be easy because it's the first two letters in community, but it's critical. And when we think about community level, we're, we're going beyond the individual and looking at the environment and policy uh, um, of factors that influence and are uh, vectors that affect the individual. Next slide. And then, uh, you know, the, the goal, uh, and, and this is Elizabeth introduced the prevention research centers briefly, but the, there are 26 prevention research centers in the United States funded by the US Centers for Disease Control that have uh, existed for 30 years and they've focused on community engagement on problems that are salient to their respective communities. And then uh, in the beginning of the uh, COVID uh, pandemic, there's been a supplement of provided to each of the prevention research centers to build uh, vaccine confidence uh, and uptake uh, using the methods that have been long established in working with communities involving trust, uh, equity, and, and respect. Uh, and, and there are the principles I think you've heard about in this class and we'll talk a little bit more about now in some case studies. Next slide. So this is a uh, um, something I'm sure many of you have already seen, but this is a, a depiction of what we mean when we say the socio-ecologic model. Uh, and um, I use it in my teaching in my classes uh, to get people to understand it's not just a matter of um, uh, victim blaming. It's not just a matter of knowledge. It's just not a matter of the individual that at the, at the smallest level, lowest level, the individual is important and ultimately uh, uh, will um, the outcomes will relate to individual behavior uh, to partially, but that the individuals influenced uh, at many levels, uh, overlaying levels in terms of their interpersonal that involves those individuals that the uh, 
person works with and lives with and uh, is connected to. Uh, at the next level, there there are organizations, uh, you know, workplaces and schools and social institutions and health departments uh, that all impact uh, the individual and, and need to be uh, included in uh, uh, intervention strategies. And that those individuals and interpersonal relationships and organizations reside in a community. And in the community, there's a greater dynamic going on. It's not just an individual, but groups of individuals and communities have norms and culture. Uh, and they need to be uh, considered and uh, uh, included in intervention strategies and planning. And then lastly, all of this exists in a, uh, a larger national uh, culture uh, that dictates public policy. And I think most of you are aware certainly of some of the dilemmas in the United States regarding um, uh, the uh, difficult policy environment where many of the COVID recommendations around vaccinations have been politicized and that public policy uh, uh, trickles down through the uh, different levels of the socioeconomical model. Uh, next slide, please. So there are a number of strategies, and I think you've seen these almost verbatim in some of the earlier slides from today, but uh, examples of community level strategies are building action teams, uh, community-wide events, um, uh, efforts to uh, influence social norms, uh, engagement of uh, influencers and leaders and trusted messengers, uh, uh, coordination uh, across community organizations, which often is one of the most challenging areas unless you can really inculcate a, uh, a culture of collaboration as opposed to competition and then advocacy for uh, uh, the proper policies. And uh, these principles or strategies are really uh, key to uh, all of the work around vaccination uptake and as well as other public health challenges. Next, please. So I wanna take my last few minutes to talk about uh, our project uh, of working with refugees in a uh, resettlement community uh, in um, uh, Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, and just let me preface this by saying, uh, those of you who may not be familiar, there within the uh, immigration world, there are refugees, uh, immigrants, and migrants, or called RIM community. Refugees take a certain special status specifically in the US and in that individuals who are um, needing or to relocate because of danger uh, can apply to be resettled uh, in the US. And um, it's been uh, an incredibly successful program over the years. It was uh, almost ended during the Trump administration has been revitalized during the Biden administration and individuals who are uh, refugees go through a vetting process with the US State Department and get resettled in communities around the US. And uh, Clarkston, next slide please, is a community um, outside of Atlanta, Georgia in the Southeastern United States. That's one of the most, uh, it's one of the largest refugee resettlement communities in, in, the, uh, in the US. Um, uh, it's often referred to as the Ellis Island of the South, and Ellis Island was the uh, island off of New York City where refugees and immigrants uh, entered the U.S. at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, because of its diversity, uh, it's also referred to as one of the most diverse square miles in America, um, over, and it has over 10,000 residents, half are foreign-born uh, from 50 different countries. And interestingly, uh, the other half are primarily African-American. So we have a mixture of uh, quite diverse community in which we're working. Uh, next slide. So going back to the community level strategies, which uh, you saw earlier, uh, there was there's some key principles or strategies that 
we've used, uh, this is even independent of seeing the earlier slides, but uh, listening is really at the top of the list uh, and in order to establish trust. And, and we've done that, I think, very well. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that, but uh, a lot of it involves working with trusted messengers and having an existing relationship. Um, but there are special assets and resources that have been brought to bear to achieve the results. I'll, I'll end my presentation on showing you. But there are resettlement agencies like the International Rescue Committee that are funded to help support the resettlement of refugees. Um, there are special COVID activities, particularly by CORE, which is a community, stands for Community Organized Release Effort, um, which helps during disasters and started during the Haiti earthquake. There are health clinics, health departments, uh, city government, uh, schools, and employers. So all of these folks uh, play a role and are at the table. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, these are just some pictures that get away from the words of some of the school-based events. Once uh, vaccines were approved for elementary school students, we used this to the theme called superheroes uh, and had events at schools, uh, which were incredibly successful that parents would bring their kids to schools. It'd be a fun time. And through this mechanism, we vaccinated over a thousand individuals, uh, half students and half the parents of students. So thinking about events uh, at institutions, making them fun, uh, the, uh, uh, we found to be very successful. Next slide, please. Uh, and this is just a, a flyer illustrating the kind of the theme. Next, please. Uh, the other uh, part of it was key to our work was uh, we engaged community ambassadors uh, where we recruited and then paid uh, individuals from the largest community population groups, uh, particularly uh, Burmese, representing the Burmese, Congolese, Middle Eastern, Afghan, and Sudanese communities um, and African American uh, to uh, work as messengers, trusted messengers, and work within their communities. And then we've also provided funds to uh, small grassroots nonprofits to help them support their work. Uh, and we also then we had a, uh, just recently a, a community-wide listening session to bring the refugees and the immigrant populations together so we can hear their concerns. Uh, next slide. So these are uh, the ambassadors that we hired uh, representing the communities uh, that uh, were the largest uh, refugee communities, as I mentioned. Uh, and language obviously is key to success. And these are individuals from the community uh, who were really committed to uh, outreach and answering questions and listening. Um, next slide. Uh, the, the challenges I'm sure you've heard over the course of this course is that there's uh, uh, a lot of misinformation that goes on both domestically and for refugee community that they get from overseas. You run into in, uh, influential individuals who are just uh, undermining the effort around vaccinations. Um, one of the problems we have in the community is that we have frontline workers who don't have the flexibility uh, and, and transportation to get the vaccination sites because they're working in chicken plants and other types of food processing, low pay uh, uh, facilities that they don't have the uh, opportunities that many of us have. And, and also we, we learned that there's a need for plain and simple messaging in the first language of the refugees and interpretation. Uh, next slide. Um, so let me conclude by just talking about some of our results. What we did is we, we looked at the vaccine uptake rates that are monitored by the state and local health departments. And we compared that to what's called the social vulnerability index. And the social vulnerability index is a, um, uh, a, a, met a metric that CDC has developed that's on the web um, that 
rates communities in terms of level of vulnerability, with zero being the least vulnerable and one being the most vulnerable. And this index consists of uh, measures of uh, socioeconomic status, household composition, minority status and language, and housing type. And this information we then cross-referenced with vaccine uptake at the census tract level for our uh, refugee community in Clarkson, Georgia. And let me show you the results now. Next slide. Uh, what, what we found, much to our uh, pleasure, the, the blue lines are is partially vaccinated and the red lines are fully vaccinated, but just for simplicity and, and time, if we just look at the red line now in Clarkston, and you can see Clarkston has a social vulnerability of 0.92, which is among the most vulnerable anywhere in the country, high vulnerability, but also high vaccine rates. When you compare Clarkston to other areas in DeKalb County where we're located, their fully vaccinated rate was 47%, Clarkston was 66%. And even if you compare to uh, uh, DeKalb County as a whole that had vulnerability half as high, the Clarkston vaccine rates were uh, still higher than the county that we're in and also the state of Georgia. And so my take home message for you is that by using a socio-ecological model, by engaging uh, local community leaders and ambassadors, and by en engaging the assets that you have in the community, a vulnerable community among the most vulnerable can have higher vaccine rates than the county as a whole or the state as a whole. Uh, and we're very excited about these results and, and would encourage any community um, uh, particularly the vulnerable communities that by engaging the proper um, uh, folks, you can make a huge difference. So um, the last, I think the last slide, I'll, I'll turn it back to Elizabeth and Tina. This is Raza Yusufin Ray. I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Public Health Sciences, University of Rochester, New York. I'm going to talk about the notion of social relations to promote vaccine demand and specifically the case of Finger Lakes Rural Immunization Initiative, in which we develop interventions to activate and empower trusted messengers to have better communications with their clients and other network members. We know that diseases spread in social networks, like any contagious disease. Um, we also know that ideas and beliefs spread in social relationships, and people talk about their thinkings, their beliefs and behaviors with their network members, including family, friends, clients, other patients, and other people in their social networks. We know that uh, social contagion works for both substantiated and valid information, as well as fake news and uh, unsubstantiated information, which spreads faster in social networks, mostly in online and social media networks. Um, social networks could be used as interventions to promote the spreads of, uh, spread of beliefs and behaviors. We know that uh, local opinion leaders or the people who are trusted by, the, by their members of the community are effective interventions to improve behaviors and beliefs about healthcare. Uh, in the context of COVID-19 vaccine, we learn about trusted messengers or the people who are uh, trusted by the community members and talk with them about uh, getting vaccine. Who are these trusted messengers? Um, trusted messengers could be community members, could be first responders, could be an influential member of the society, could be healthcare providers. Eight in 10 patients in different studies showed that they rely on their doctors when they are deciding about uh, getting vaccines. And most of these healthcare providers are already vaccinated. So they can serve as trusted messengers for many patients. <clears throat> and you put this patient healthcare professional relationship in a bigger context of other social relations. Patients talk to their family members, other patients, caregivers, opinion leaders, etc., as well as healthcare professionals who talk to their own personal networks, as well as professional networks of peers and other patients. So the cascade of social relationships and social influence go beyond immediate conversation between a healthcare provider and a patient. 
We asked these uh, healthcare uh, trusted messengers in a small survey in our community about the people they talked about uh, talked with about getting COVID-19 vaccine during the last couple of weeks, as well as the influencers or potential trusted messengers that they know and interacted with. The 63 people who participated in our survey roughly um, talked with more than 400 patients and clients or potential targets about getting COVID-19 vaccine. And also they were familiar and they were aware of more than 500 other trusted messengers that uh, they could share information with. So uh, any intervention that we implement on these small group of people could go much beyond uh, the, the realm of these immediate participants through the cascades of social influence and relationships. Finger Lakes Rural Immunization Initiative, or FLIRI, aim to identify and empower trusted messengers to have better communication with their um, network members and patients and clients. Uh, it was built upon these four pillars of building capability about conversation with uh, patients and other network members, uh, improving their confidence in these conversations, uh, convenience of referring to getting vaccine and facilitation for uh, being vaccinated, as well as contagion or social relationships um, to promote and, and, and broaden the realm of uh, the conversations that are happening in the context of trusted messenger and the patient and clients. We tested various interventions and we ended up with a performance-based intervention. We call it theater for vaccine hesitancy or uh, changing the conversation workshops. These workshops have been implemented both in person and also online through Zoom that you can find one of the videos on the, in this YouTube link. It is a performance-based or play-based uh, intervention to engage participants in building a better communication and conversation style with their uh, network members about vaccination. Uh, it is built upon uh, self-determination theory, a behavior theory of motivation. Uh, we think that people need competence, need autonomy, and need relatedness about uh, the behavior that they are going to adopt, so they are being motivated to, to change their behavior. And uh, theater for vaccine hesitancy is built upon theater of the oppressed, uh, a performance-based method to empower um, uh, oppressed communities, as well as a tool to, for social change and conflict resolution. We adapted the process and the content into the context of uh, COVID-19 vaccine. So the, uh, it's a play-based or a script-based method. So it starts with a conversation that, that doesn't go very well between a patient who is hesitant and the doctor who tries to convince the patient. The doctor doesn't use the, uh, the best methods to convince the patients. And then the audience comes into play. They reflect on these conversation and they change the script in a way that works better. And they reenact the play uh, by taking different roles of the patient and healthcare provider. Uh, we developed topics uh, for, for these plays, for pregnancy, children, healthy adults, speed of vaccine development, and conspiracy theory, and we are continuously updating that. We also uh, accompanied uh, these empowerment-based approach with uh, the quick links method, or uh, facilitatory documents to help the healthcare providers and other trusted messengers have better communication with patients when they want to refer them to valid resources. So this is a one-page document including the QR codes that patient, can, patient and healthcare provider can use their smartphone to basically get into the valid resource like a CDC or WHO or other important resources about important questions that the patient or um, the, the client may have related to COVID-19 uh, disease and also the vaccination. Uh, so far, we had 16 workshops involving 133 trusted messengers. Many of them were healthcare providers, but also we had workshops. We adapted the content for community-based trusted messengers. Uh, after the workshop, trusted messengers felt more confident uh, having conversation with their patients and clients and other network members. We also, after, after a month of the workshop, we asked them about how many people they talked with. Uh, these 133 people talked with more than 500 patients and clients about getting COVID-19 vaccine, um, shared the workshop material with more, uh, more than 250 colleagues, and also shared the skills that they learned through the workshop with more than 300 colleagues. So as you can see, uh, the intervention that they initiated can spread much faster and broader into the uh, social uh, connections of people, including the trusted messengers that they trained. In summary, we think that social influence is an important mechanism for behavior change. We know that patients listen to their doctors and healthcare providers about, uh, about vaccination. Uh, people talk with each other and other network members. 
uh, about their decision. So there is the cascade of social influence that could be activated. We know that effective interventions should have four important pillars of improving capability, improving confidence, improving, improving the convenience and contagion, which is the social process here. Theater for vaccine hesitancy is a potentially effective intervention to improve conversation and, and facilitate capability and confidence in trusted messengers. And we know that the impact goes beyond our immediate participants. Social influence is at work and people can share ideas and beliefs with much broader networks. So the impact is higher than what we expect. Uh, so I finish here and turn it back to the workshop leads.